uh, extremely delighted to uh, talk to you about uh, the materials research in India and uh, with specific reference to projections and uh, possibilities that are uh, before us uh, on uh, material synthesis in India per se. And uh, we have been uh, looking at various modules uh, especially on the synthesis and all the characterization tools that are available today to study uh, a range of materials. And uh, as we see that the devices applications of these materials are going nano and we probe more into nano world. The uh, landscape for materials research is not uh, uh, going small rather it is becoming big and we have larger uh, uh, audience for this research. We have many groups working on uh, a spectrum of uh, issues related to material synthesis. Uh, not only it is uh, a field for uh, chemistry to explore for chemist uh, those who involved in chemistry, uh, but also physicists are equally contributing to materials research and uh, equally uh, from the technology side engineering uh, departments are contributing. Um, and in today's uh, talk, um, I want to introduce uh, Professor E. C. Subarao who is with us and it is a, a rare opportunity to have him visiting uh, IIT Kanpur. Uh, he is one of the person who really pioneered uh, the research in materials science. Uh, in fact, he was instrumental to start many programs on materials research and also few departments which are now existing it is because of his vision and uh, um, he, uh, of the untiring efforts uh, that uh, he left behind. So, uh, he has been uh, with us on and off and today it is a rare privilege to have him here uh, in the studio and I request uh, Professor E. C. Subarao to come and share a uh, few uh, milestones that uh, IIT Kanpur has um, uh, traveled through and also he since he has uh, um, a global understanding of how the materials research is going on uh, both in India as well as in world at large. I request him to give some projection about the importance of materials research uh, both in India as well as abroad. I now give time for uh, Professor E. C. Subarao to share his uh, thoughts. Very kind of Professor Sundar Manoharan to uh, give me a chance. to say a little bit about material science, sort of homecoming for me and uh, what I would like to do is as has indicated a little bit about the road that material science has taken at IIT Kanpur over a period of time, put it in the framework of the world scene and then conclude by saying a little bit about where is material science headed in the years to come and its importance. When the Russians put up Sputnik, the Americans became very jittery. They, they were doing a lot on metals, they said that, but they did not put science into that very much. And so they woke up and suddenly they thought that there is without science we cannot understand materials. Just to make something a little bit harder and so on is by processing is not that all that is enough. So it became kind of a pressing issue and places like MIT and some other places got into material science to understand materials from a scientific standpoint, not only from engineering and uh, technology standpoint. When IIT was set up, there was an agreement between the US and IIT Kanpur that we two would work together. There were nine universities in the US that formed a consortium and worked with us and these included some of the best in the US. Very interestingly right from the beginning even for undergraduate students for everybody in the institute we had a course on material science and 
This is taught by people from various departments. For example, Professor C. N. R. Rao was one of them, and uh, Professor Parasnis, and uh, people from other departments also participated, either as teachers or as tutors, and so on. And about that time, because that we were having already a course, we wanted to know whether we are doing the right things. So, in 1966, we held the first conference on material science education in India. Very interestingly, out of the 100 participants or so, about 50 came from educational institutions, all the IITs, Institute of Science, BHU, and so, Regional Engineering College, and so on. But the more interesting part is the other 50 came from industry. They also wanted to know what's going on in material science. And we were lucky to have three major stalwarts in material science in the US. Professor Maris Cohen from MIT, who is sort of a father of material science, and uh, uh, John Don from University of California, Berkeley, and Azarov from University of Connecticut. They, together with the local people, <coughs> we conducted a week long conference, and in a way, that laid the foundation for material science education and research in this country. All these people that came went back and started something in their own institutions. On our own part, we started the, a graduate program at the master's and PhD level in material science and managed to set up an advanced center for material science. Uh, and in these courses, as well as in the material, advanced center for material science, it is an interdisciplinary activity, which is kind of a, a lifeblood of IIT Kanpur as it grew. Interdisciplinary activity is a magic word for Kanpur. So, we had people from various departments, chemistry, physics, Electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, of course, metallurgy, participating in it. The interdisciplinary program was so much that my first PhD student in IIT Kanpur got his degree in physics and, uh, and others too later. Now, starting from there, we wanted to educate the rest of the We wanted to educate the rest of the educational scene in India about this. So, very religiously for a number of years, we ran a one month course for engineering college teachers for on material science. And these people went back and started to teach in their respective universities, institutions. The second thing that we did was, it is not enough to read from a book the relationship between materials, their properties, their processing and their behavior. Unless students really dirty their hands doing some experiments. And so, the first undergraduate lab for material science was set up in Kanpur. And after we refined the experiments, we decided to put it in the form of a book. And True to the tradition of IIT Kanpur, though I was in a way the instigator for that effort, I made sure that uh, there were four other co-authors to the book, all of them under 30. And they came with degrees from Oxford, Sheffield and various places. And uh, luckily, and everybody in India wanted to publish it and I did not want to give it to somebody locally because then he would send it to some local university and uh, they would not even understand what we are talking about and the comments I get from them are not going to be useful. So, I wanted to give it abroad. So, I took two copies with me to the US and I sent it to two publishers. One publisher returned it in uh, one week saying that we did not look at the technical content, we looked at the commercial, how many copies would we sell, would we make our usual amount of money and we thought that we may not make so much money. The second one I did not hear for, for quite a while. 
and that was McGraw Hill. And after something like three months, I get a three page letter saying that uh, normally we hire three reviewers and pay them money and they have to review and give at least a two page report on the book uh, and uh, the author has to take those things into account and make the revisions and all that. In this case, because the book came from India, we were skeptical and we wanted to be W. Shaw. So, we took six uh, reviewers. All the reviews have come and we had the shock of our life. Not one had uh, anything negative to say, not a word to be changed. It is such an unbelievable experience for us that we are going to break our publishing tradition. And normally when you submit a paper to a journal, the reviewer's comments are sent anonymously to you. You don't know who the reviewer is. And that is more so in the case of books. In this case, because they were so uniformly complimentary, we are sending here with all the six letters with the letterhead and the signature of the man. And the next shock for us is, this came from India and the language would be atrocious and therefore the editorial staff would have to work very hard at it. So we went and sent it to the editorial office and within a week they returned it to us saying we couldn't touch even a word, we couldn't cross a T or dot an I. And this was the second shock for us. So with this, we sent it to the printer, it is under print, here is your contract. And uh, it has since been translated into other languages. It is used at MIT, Berkeley, and everywhere uh, abroad also. Translated into Spanish and various other languages. So that is the spirit of material science in Kanpo. And uh, then there are other things that have been written. But the fact that it is um, made an effort and that it went so well and uh, actually, when the royalties started coming, they wrote to me, you are the senior author, how do we distribute the royalties? I said, everybody is an equal partner, give it 20 percent to everybody. And uh, then, now I would come to uh, a little bit about where material science is going. Understandably, in the very early years, it is to try to understand materials that are already in use whether it is metals, ceramics, a bit of polymers and so on. But as time went by, it turned out there is a feeling that there are more dimensions to the problem. 1 plus 1 can be 3. So if you are able to make composites of more than one material, then the properties may be far better than either of them have. So composites became a pretty fashionable area. And uh, it has added a lot to our understanding and use of materials. And uh, the other major change that has taken place is in processing. There were conventional ways of making materials. If you begin to use some normal synth synthesis methods, you may end up with materials with a different set of properties. A very good example of that is when you take two, two materials and mix them together and heat them, you form some new phases. And there is a phase diagram for it, composition temperature diagrams. At Caltech, Paul Duve found that some of these materials when they are cooled rapidly from high temperatures, instead of crystallizing with a regular crystal structure, they become what they call metallic glasses with properties that were unbelievable. Nobody dreamt of them. There is a metal inside, it is a glass and it opened up a vast area. In true tradition of uh, IIT Kanpur, as soon as Paul Duve came up with met glass, here we started to work on that. For example, I had a B.Tech student, we wanted to study some of its properties. And he studied and he came up with something very interesting. 
it got published in applied physics letters and this fellow wrote to Paul Duet with a copy of this paper and straight from his B.Tech he got into Caltech and uh, got his Ph.D. there. So, that is another dimension. More recently the trend has been to go to fibers, small dimensions and also not only dimensions in diameter, but dimensions in all directions. So, that we end up with materials that are nanoparticles. The properties that these exhibit are very different from what one could predict from the properties of uh, bulk materials. The other important direction it is taking is there is a marriage that is taking place between material science and a variety of other fields. Some of them are unbelievably remote from material science. Here I am referring to biological sciences and human body and uh, people are beginning to find out that our muscles, the way they behave, the way they age and the way they give trouble and all that we never understood. Now, by extending our knowledge about the mechanical properties of other relative, relative species, we are beginning to understand how the muscles behave under various conditions. This has become a pretty big area. A, another very big area is things connected with heart for example whether it is a heart valve or whether it is a stent, people were putting in whatever was available. In India, we never made valves, so we need to import and uh, it is out of the reach of most people. So, luckily we were, there is a man from Hopkins that came to India and he wanted to set up a cardiology center, but that would have a lab and a manufacturing facility. It is called Chitra Tidnal Center in Trivandrum and uh, he set it up. They, they joined hands with DMR and Hyderabad and they started to make titanium based valves and they are available for a fraction of the cost that an imported one would do. So, like this there are it has become even more interdisciplinary than it started out with. The applications have become rather widespread and the dimensions have changed completely. The synthetic methods of making these materials in the shape, size and uh, composition that we need them have completely drastically changed and this has opened up a vast new area. And I would say that high strength materials and biomedical applications are two areas where material science is going to grow in a very big way. I think, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, sir, I came for uh, Viva OC IAC. I am so happy that you agreed to spare uh, your precious time for this uh, video interview on the theme of materials chemistry which will be viewed by NPTEL subscribers. Mm -hmm. In India, you have had the longest journey with the area of solid state chemistry and materials chemistry. You have laid a long, strong foundation for this field and have put India in the map of materials world. Um, I, as we know, you, you have taught uh, wonderful physical chemistry courses at IIT Kanpur in the early 70s. And solid state chemistry. Solid state chemistry. So, I want to know when exactly you started this okay. research. Okay. Uh, for me, solid state chemistry uh, is part of my life. In fact, it slowly emerged to become materials chemistry. When I started working in it nearly 53, 54 years ago, the subject was not known. In fact, if ever, wherever I mentioned the subject's name, the solid state chemistry, people would laugh and even make jokes about it. They all knew solid state physics, but very few knew solid state chemistry. In fact, in their entire world at last, there were not even 20, 30 known chemists at the time. And I got to know some of them very closely 
like Jay Sanderson in Oxford, some of them in Germany, uh, slowly. And then I decided around 1956-57 that this will be one of my major areas of research. And I started working in it as soon as I joined Indian Institute of Science as a faculty member in 1959. And slowly I developed the subject uh, in various ways, particularly in the area of oxides. Because at that time I decided oxides constitute the best or the most important family of materials with the widest range of properties. Any property, electrical property, any property you take, oxides offer the maximum range as well as maximum varieties and structures and all. So I have worked on synthesis, structures, phenomena, properties, a number of things. Slowly I have expanded my area to various other things, carbon materials, hybrid materials, and I do more synthesis and much more chemistry today than in the early days. It was all dry chemistry now, much more wet chemistry I do. And I have always used lots of spectroscopy, diffraction and a number of techniques. That is the beauty of the subject. It is highly interdisciplinary. In fact, you have to know enough physics to do good chemistry. And if you are knowing physics aspect, in fact, they have to know good chemistry. Materials itself has become an area where the interdisciplinary need for knowledge of sister disciplines. It has been a pleasure to work here and train a large number of students. I have had, a, I don't know how many now, at least 100 people who have got PhDs with me and more and a large number of others. And it has been a wonderful thing to grow with this subject. In fact, I, I still remember John Goodenough and Hall, uh, Paul Agarmuda, though they are much older than me, they are almost my contemporaries in science because their first papers are also in 50s. When I was very young, I was also starting at the same time. So it has been a wonderful thing to see a lot of work coming, not only a large number of wonderful young people, not only in India but abroad who have worked with me or collaborated with me. Some of them, some of them have become famous now in this subject. So it has been a pleasure. Uh, I think the, the, the area is becoming much more interesting in the last few years because of the tremendous uh, interfaces it has developed with biology, physics, chemistry, materials, you know, various branches of chemistry. So I think it is a, a good area and I in fact believe in the entire area of chemical science materials form one direction, biological direction is the other one. So I think uh, in India we are not, there are not enough people working in it uh, but fortunately uh, I th things seem to be improving and I hope there will be more young people working in this area and contribute to the world at large. Whatever I am worth today is because much of the work I have done here. I've had large number of books I brought out, papers, and uh, people have read some of them. They cite a lot of my papers. So uh, even from India, we have been able to do reasonably good work, and which is noticed all over the world. Uh, that has been a pleasure. Sir, actually, you mentioned about uh, oxides in particular among the various inorganic solids you work. Uh, can you please give some uh, one or two examples of well oxides for example yeah. it, if you, I start working on simple binary oxides for like TiO2, ReO3 like that but later of course this, the complexity of oxides are the at the same time the excitement of oxides is because of the wonderful structures they can make another reason is the metal oxygen bond it is not like metal sulfur bond too covalent it is not like the metal halogen bond too ionic. It is just the right thing, with the, you have, you have the metal also has d electrons, so give very few interesting magnetic properties, and metal oxygen bonds have great amount of ionicity and covalence, giving rise to also metallicity. Metallicity is possible in metal oxides, at the same time you can have properties due to localized electrons, all kinds of variety of properties, the entire gamut of properties, that is one. And particularly some of the structural motors, like the perovskites, most materials today you look at it, whether it's ferroelectric or superconductors, many of them are, most of them are uh, 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 having a perovskite structure, like that. So perovskites have been one of my favorites, but I work on other things too. Uh, but in recent times I worked on charge ordered materials, all of them are not perovskite necessarily, or similarly multiferroics. Uh, multiferroics is get a very exciting, very interesting problem uh, that I have worked on in the last few years. So, uh, I think oxide gives you a very nice way of uh, thinking. Even today there are surprises. I will give you one example. For example, aluminum oxide. The most usually aluminum oxide is it has a corundum structure or something related. Iron oxide, Fe2O3, lots of alpha Fe2O3 is corundum. You mix the two, AlFeO3, 
is more stable, not in the coronal structure, but in the non-central symmetric chiral crystal, uh, chiral, uh, uh, non-central symmetric space. Group. So this surprise is like that. We always have surprises. And that's why and many new phenomena and properties keep coming because of these things. And I think there is a tremendous uh, possibility. Sir, uh, since you mentioned about this alumina fe 3 case, uh, I just want to know whether there is anything that we need to bear in mind to master making this. Yeah, I think the, to, be, to be honest, there are two things. Yes. You have to train your mind the way to think in materials. That is where India, I don't see enough. People don't know how to think in this subject. Every subject, if you are really dedicated to sub that subject, after 10, 20, 30 years, depending on one's ability and one's luck, you develop a feeling for a subject which is intuitive. That intuition in material space is very complex. It is based on knowledge of the periodic table first. Other than that, how to use the periodic table, uh, that is not easy to learn by the way. It is easy, you teach something to young kids, but to use it is a very clever usage of uh, periodic table you have to do. Other than that, uh, the structures, how to deal with the structures, manipulating structures. Once you get that intuitive feeling, you know, then you have to, you can design new things. How to design a new material, for example. That is why, you know, uh, the designing new structures, new compounds, particularly even hybrid materials, inorganic, organic hybrids. I think it's a fantastic area to work in. Unfortunately, uh, I have done enough, uh, some of it, but uh, unfortunately getting old, I would have done much more. But for young people, that is a very good area to work on. So, like that, like for inorganic nanotubes. See, the people all made carbon, carbon, carbon. Why now only carbon? Why carbon is also inorganic. But inorganic oxide nanotubes, sulfide nanotubes, a lot of work to be done in that. So, that, like that, graphene, inorganic graphene. Everywhere, you know, you, uh, that's what I have done. As soon as graphene came, I started working on graphene like structures of boron nitride and molybdenum sulfide, same with nanotubes. So, right away, you use a newer area you get into by just because the variety that chemistry offers and variety not only in terms of compositions but also in terms of structures. Mm -hmm. Sir, you also mentioned about uh, the interfaces that has emerged because of working on solid state chemistry. With the advent of nano science and nanotechnology sure. coming, uh, is there any uh, reason why we need to stay focused on materials chemistry or how much we can as traditional solid state chemistry? Nano chemistry is part of solid state chemistry. Yes. I don't like the word solid state chemistry anymore. Yeah. Unfortunately, you can see what has happened to that old wonderful general called General of Solid State Chemistry. Mm -hmm. I've been on the editorial board ever since the general started in 1968. But uh, unfortunately, that has all become dry uh, materials. You know, for the real materials today, you make it by different methods. Uh, they are much more complex, much more, uh, 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 much more chemical than some of the structures uh, that you see in old science and chemistry. So, be better, better to say materials chemistry or chemistry materials rather than calling science and chemistry. So, there are very few people call them science and chemistry anymore. They call them just materials chemists or something. But even solid state chemistry uh, or materials chemistry, whatever you call it, has, has taken over new and like entire nano. 90% of nano is nano chemistry materials and solid state chemistry. Making it, studying properties, phenomena, making composites, that's all uh, solid state material chemistry, according to me. Sir, actually, there is. I don't think nano chemistry is a separate subject, but sure. it's part of materials yeah, special case. Uh, there is also a slight shift from working on bulk materials to go into thin films and nanostructuring. Yeah. Uh, the thin films, once you go there, I am no longer interested in that. But, well, nanomaterials are also partly like thin films. Yes. But the thing is, you know, there is only a form, form. I mean, it is not a new materials concept. Yes. Thin films will have new properties because in the film you will have all, all kinds of things. Yes. But solid state chemists study forms, uh, study materials in various forms. So thin films in London, some of it is in bulk, some of it is in, uh, purely polycrystalline, some of maybe in film form, some maybe in some other form, so some of it in nano form, uh, nano materials. So so I don't think everything is important. Solid state chemistry deals with materials of com comprising of organic, inorganic, and all po as possible ways of making them. It includes all forms. Amorphous, crystalline, nano, films, every kind of form. It also includes all properties, surface properties, catalytic properties, electrical properties, magnetic properties, every type of property. That is why the subject is exciting and all pervasive because it includes all phenomena, all possible properties, all possible forms, all possible components. 
uh, it need not be crystalline, it can be a marker. So if it's a glass, we don't say it's not sunset chemistry. We don't mind, we, we can study that too. So I think that is why, uh, that is how I view this opinion. Sir, one of the problems we have when visiting your website is which paper to read because so many papers no, have come. No, but I just want to know in the last three decades what are you published? Some three or four classic papers that uh, are still I don't know. I, I can list uh, 20 papers. Yeah. Actually, recently the Indian Social Science Press, along with the World Scientific, brought out a collection of my uh, 60 papers. I don't know if you have seen that. It's called Trends in Materials Chemistry. Okay. And earlier they had brought down when I became 70 a volume called Advances in Chemistry or something like that. Or uh, with 70 papers of mine. But anyway, th 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 that is any point. Uh, 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 they will show some of it. But actually, I'm, as I'm growing older, I'm publishing better and better papers. In the last three years, I published my best papers in my life, after my 70, 70th year. I think my, my best research in my subject has been in the last six to seven years, after I became 70. So, I, I, and also my citations are increasing uh, like mad in the last five years. It is now 3,000 to 3,500 per year. So I just now crossed 40,000 citations, uh, total citations of paper. So, uh, so there's no end. You know, uh, the, the thing about this subject uh, is uh, old age and all doesn't matter. You can work for a really long time. Uh, so you can, in fact, you, you can improve even when you become old. So I don't want to pinpoint one. For example, I've done some very interesting things in graphene just now. Some other things in oxides. You know, a lot of interesting data. So we can look at the strengths in yeah. chemistry. Yeah, uh, yeah, that, that I can uh, I will give a copy of that. Sure, that will be a pleasure. And also we can give this as a reading material for the yeah, sure. okay. books. And last question, uh, I also touched upon uh, the things that we need to bear in mind, especially when we work on solids. Uh, your advice to those uh, who are going to work future generation. Yeah, I, I, I hope if our young people will take up this subject because of this interdisciplinary nature and also possible applications, technology that may come out also is there. More than anything, this subject has a number of phenomena, number of properties, which require, if you are an experimentalist, a number of techniques. In other words, you are not a technique man. In fact, some people, you know, they do some spectroscopy. They go on doing spectroscopy, all kinds of materials using that technique. I, we are not like you. Raman spectroscopy, infrared, and tomorrow you do mass bar, they are tomorrow you do neutron diffraction, you do electrical property, you do magnetic. So that, that, that is why I like this subject. You try to solve problems rather than be a, a, a sort of a servant of uh, a technique. So I, so material chemistry offers uh, tremendous opportunity. In fact, as some two fresh students are taken just for, they, they, they just come uh, here. They are here and I don't know whether they are. Uh, for example, I have trained them already within one year to make all kinds of measurements yeah. and using all kinds of spectroscopy, diffraction. Yeah. So it is very wonderful to uh, see them uh, uh, do this yes. kind of thing. Sir, so actually, uh, there is a great amount of uh, rush to the materials and we are certainly from the world, especially the abroad the laboratories are also working equally in this field. Uh, any advice that we need to have on the ethical well, issues? I don't have it. In all science, there should be a need for ethics. People cheat in all fields. People also are honest in all the fields, very good, honest people. So I can't say much about ethics. All I do is I have tried to be as ethical as I can be. I have never cheated anybody and I have never tried to lie or copy or anything like that. I hope uh, others, I, I, I have nothing to say. But this much I can say that the, the subject requires very hard work. That is why people don't like it. People want easy life. This is the wrong subject to take. Uh, if you want to make a good uh, contribution to this field, even as senior scientists, to keep on learning. There's no end. You know, even the last few weeks, I'm learning something new which I didn't know before. In fact, I, I have learned learn some new theory to understand something, all that. So, uh, people who don't want to keep changing and learning new things uh, fra probably find this uh, area too difficult or too uh, demanding. But however, if young people like challenges, I think these are better subject to work on than standard inorganic chemistry, coordination chemistry, organic synthesis. Is a, on, on all reactions are known. In any synthesis you make, you do all those reactions. Combination. What is so brilliant about that? I don't see anything. Here, you have much more possibility of using uh, intelligent design and uh, novel, novel uh, uh, approaches to the subject. Thank you, Professor. Okay, it was such a pleasure to have listened to you. Well, thank you so much.